Can you observe your thoughts? Are you even aware of them? Do you think about them? It seems natural, right? Our lives revolve around our constant internal analysis of our memories, worries, replays, or judgments, influenced by the information our eyes and ears are relaying to our brain about the world around us. We subconsciously engage, and this is how we form our reality. Our thoughts are a product of this constant processing. They need attention and validation from us to thrive. We often don't even realize we're giving them this attention. It's our usual thinking process until it becomes overwhelming. Having overwhelming thoughts is so normalized that trying to master them can seem nearly impossible. Nearly. Controlling our thoughts may not be possible. Separating ourselves from our thoughts is. My personal journey and experience trying to find this balance between my thoughts and myself comes from my practice of Buddhism. I've been a practicing Tibetan Buddhist since I was six years old. My mom introduced it to me when she discovered it, looking for a non-pharmaceutical answer to the anxiety induced by her thyroid cancer diagnosis. At the time, Buddhism, meditation, and the like made no sense to me. What was this, and why did nobody talk about it at school? But when my mom explained that over 500 million people, or 7% of the global population, practice Buddhism, my questions settled, and I became more open to the practice. She'd sit me down once a day and tell me to simply focus my attention to the rhythm of my breath. I had no clue as to what this would do for me, but I did it anyway, and good thing I did. Eventually, this established a daily meditation practice that became routine. From there, she introduced the concept of a middle path through the story of how Buddhism came to be. It went something like this. The story of Buddha says that he was originally born an Indian prince named Siddhartha Gautama, who became unhappy with the materialism and greed which came with his royalty. So he gave up everything, eventually becoming a monk who deprived himself of worldliness through starvation. He was sure that this way of life would provide him with true contentment but he was miserable there, too. He tried a ton of different things, but eventually, one day, as he meditated under a Bodhi tree, he was faced with a series of temptations. These temptations told him to go back to the life he was born in, where he belonged, to give, us, give up his search for contentment. Through Siddhartha's observance of these temptations, and then his dismissal of them, he figured out a middle path, an equilibrium between the materialistic lifestyle he was born into and the extreme deprivation he had been practicing. Thus, the heart of Buddhist philosophy was formed. In this approach, desires are moderated, and attachment is controlled but not suppressed. But in a world where ag anger and joy, sadness and love, elation and despair seem unavoidable, how is it possible to master these extremes and hold a steady place in the middle? I learned to find a middle path through meditation. The way in which my mom presented it to me revolved around unsticking your attention from your thoughts and redirecting it towards your breath. Meditation can look different for everyone. It can be as quick as a minute while walking or painting or anything in between. It simply requires your focus on your breath. Easier said than done. While I meditate, I like to think of myself as an observer of my thoughts, as if they were cars driving by on a busy highway. Through observing our thoughts instead of engaging in them, you become detached from the thought, because you no longer give it importance. This allows you to analyze the thought, find its root, and then dissolve it. Separating the thought from the self allows you to come down into the present moment as a mere observer of your everyday mental chatter. Now, I want you to pause for just a moment. Think about a thought or emotion you had today, good or bad, insignificant or hugely important. What caused this thought? Is it still relevant right now? If it isn't, what caused you to give it importance in the first place? And if it is, why are you still giving it importance now? While our feelings caused by thoughts or external factors can seem huge in the moment, chances are they'll be just another bump in the road in 10 years or maybe even 10 days. 
Taking a step back and considering the bigger picture when faced with these bumps in our road can help dissolve the initial magnitude of almost any situation. Take rejection, for instance. When we are rejected, a cascade of emotions is triggered. These emotions come from an expectation that was not met, a desire you may have had that was not fulfilled, and then the subsequent dismantling of all those illusions you had built up for yourself around it. But why was there so much attachment to a certain outcome in the first place? And how does it feel to be so attached to certain outcomes, especially when they're not in our control? From a Buddhist point of view, rejection can only be experienced if there's attachment to an expectation. Venerable Amy, a Buddhist nun and teacher, helped me understand this concept. She told me, rejection comes out of expectation, and expectation is the mother of disappointment. If we don't build up expectations, there is nothing to reject and therefore nothing to disappoint. The hard part is not forming these expectations. It takes a lot of self-awareness. <laughs> expectations, like rejection, are part of the human experience. We build them up without thinking about them, and then when they aren't satisfied, they're all we can think about. Through a near constant observation of my mind that became habit throughout the years, I learned that I can manage my expectations more fluidly which in turn helps when things don't turn out the way I want them to. As a junior in high school, I've seen so many deserving kids flat out rejected from college. Some of them had worked the majority of their lives towards opening an acceptance letter, only to be faced with the unthinkable, rejection. Seeing the impact these rejections have can be heartbreaking. But really, the rejection is not the problem. The expectation built up around a certain outcome is. Whether it was a rejection or acceptance, the elation or misery felt when opening an admissions letter speaks to a very high level of attachment to the idea of a certain school. Chances are, if someone has worked so incredibly hard, they will have a prosperous life ahead of them, regardless of where they went to college. In a world so obsessed with set outcomes, a middle way might not always be clear, and that is okay. We usually go to extremes without a second thought. Sometimes they can even feel good, like opening an acceptance letter. Through observance of our mind's ups and downs, we can create a very positive habit of mediation between these extremes. Venerable Amy shared with me how she had been rejected from her top two colleges that she had worked her entire life to be accepted into. At the moment, she couldn't understand why she hadn't been selected to attend these schools. Years after she faced that disappointment, she told me she is forever grateful for it. If she hadn't gone to the school she ended up going to, she would have missed out on a world of positive opportunities, which helped shape her into the person she is today. According to the Greater Good magazine at UC Berkeley, humans are evolutionarily hardwired to weigh negative impacts to their life more heavily than positive ones. Another fundamental of Buddhist philosophy that Venerable Amy taught me about is called reframing. It's designed to help with this negative bias through mindfulness. You can take any experience and flip your perspective on it towards a positive side. We can create a very positive external reality through simply shifting our attitudes towards it. Buddhism presents gratitude as the antidote to rejection. Appreciating the life we are provided with, along with the world of opportunity it allows us to experience, helps to automatically reframe negative experiences, which battles rejection and the feelings of disappointment that follow. Before you experienced rejection, you were still you. You still did the same things you always do, living the same life you always did. Rejection does not change that. It simply challenges an expectation you had built up for yourself that was never a guarantee. It is not alter yourself, who you are as a person, unless you allow it to. Now, am I saying that if you sit down with your thoughts tonight or do a mindfulness meditation, all your problems will be solved and you'll be free from attachment? No. But it can be the first step towards developing a self-beneficial relationship with your mind. Buddhism is my path, the tool that I use to navigate life. I invite you to find the path that works for you, that allows you to realize a more centered self, one in which you can experience fewer extremes, find more gratitude, and become unbound from attachment. 
Find your middle path and start walking.